Okay. So what I'm going to talk about um, this afternoon for the last few minutes here is a project that started at Stanford University to try to give everybody out there, all of you, the ability to actually value ecosystem services on the landscape without having to get a PhD in economics. So this is a tall order. This is like a 10-year project, so we've just started on it. But um, this is what you know we're trying to do. So here we go. OK. One of the things, there was a review of the, of the payment for ecosystem service programs that are in place right now. And the systematic review basically found that none of these, these systems or these schemes had actually measured whether they were getting the benefit they were paying for. So we could actually be getting some benefit but wasting a lot of money to get this benefit. So when I, when I talk about this GIS system that we're developing that any of you can download and use, I want you to avoid that problem. I don't want you to implement a program that years later people will come back and say it was a big waste of money. So what, um, the, that's what the, the motivation for this program, or for this system of software is to help you go beyond the vague notion that nature is good for, good for us or good for the, or conservation is good for nature and that to make sure that we're actually getting more than what we're paying for. OK, so the first thing that this project has tried to deal with is what is a service? Um, and we basically decided that a service is only a, a process, an ecological process, is only a service if it's va of value to people. So if you have flood control in a plane that no one lives in, there's no value to it. You may save some animals, but from a human perspective, it's not affecting us at all. So as Nancy Boxtel et al. said in a paper that came out in 2000 in response to the Costanza paper from 1997, said that it only relates to the contribution in human welfare. Okay? So that's, the, that's kind of the starting point. And these pictures down below are all you know, ways that the service is of value to people. Okay? Now, um, yeah, you may... And notice that it's, it's the contribution that people to make to human welfare, and that means putting a dollar value on it. And a lot of you may not agree with that, but if you want to um, engage any policymaker, that's the only way you're going to engage them, usually. Okay, there might be a couple of cases, but we're going under the assumption that a dollar value and it is a way to engage policymakers. It also allows us to compare and contrast services. Okay, so is this a service or not? Is this just an ecological process? Okay. I'm not going to answer that. You can contemplate that yourselves. But this kind of gets back to the issue of first we have to define what a service is, and then anything else that's not a service we're going to ignore. Okay. <clears throat> There's been a lot of talk about the systems and the and the models that we can uh, economic approaches and methods we can use to value ecosystem services, and I just want to point out three things that have already been brought up. One of the important things is that where are people on the landscape in relation to the ecological processes? So that's a huge factor that affects all of these methods, okay? And another thing that you have brought up earlier is that we tend to focus on benefits, but what are the costs of all of these systems, these changes in systems? So, and the third thing is that people will react to change. So just as Amy brought up, we have to start thinking about the feedback. So if we change the ecosystem or the provision of services, how will people react? And then the other thing that we want to emphasize in this evaluation of services is that we want to, we want to keep things well-defined. So you know, one of the criticisms of the Costanza paper was is that that's not a well-defined change. This is the total value of the world. Well, give us a well-defined change if we sacrifice one wetland what are the ramifications, both economically and ecologically, okay? And that when we do this valuation, we need to look at what are the, um, how, how does the particular wetland or whatever fit within the ecosystem? And so what are the benefits or costs within that system? So we're going to try to avoid uh, benefit transfer in this one. We're actually going to try to say, what is the value within the system? And again, you know, how does this relate to people? How do people react to changes? And who um, gets the benefit? OK, so the first big challenge is the technical challenge of, of engaging both the economic 
world and the e ecological world, and that we're going to focus on production functions. So this can be widely applied to any landscape, and we don't have to worry about... So if, if we give a series of inputs to the production function, then we'll get a series of outputs that are very applicable and very and, and, and are related to that um, landscape. Now, some of the technical difficulties are um, economics doesn't do very well over space. It doesn't do very well. Economic analysis is difficult over space, especially when there's interdependencies and externalities. And if one landowner above you on the stream makes a change, you have to react to that. And to, to analyze economics in that respect with all these multi, you know, multi agents reacting in time and different spaces and times, it can be very difficult. Okay, so there's a technical challenge of both creating production functions both ecologically and economically and putting them together. <clears throat> but the biggest challenge is, is how do we provide this, um, this system so people can use it and that non-economists or non-ecologists can sit down with ArcMap or ArcGIS and actually start to try to make some estimates. This is what um, Gretchen Daly and Peter Kriev have been referring to. How can we mainstream this concept of ecosystem service evaluation? So that's the Natural Capital Project. So <clears throat> it's a series of service models, you know, so water flow, water quality, carbon sequestration, where we give the supply, the, bio, the biophysical supply of the service, how much of that service is used by people, and what's the value of that use. We're going to mostly focus on social values, and we're, gonna, we're, not gonna, we're not too proud to beg. We'll take any valuation method that gives us any valuation, any, any um, value at all. So it may be inc incomplete. It may not be the total economic value, but at least gives us a lower bound. So we'll do incomplete but doable valuation. And again, we're going to try to avoid benefit transfer. And also, because we're looking at a production function system here, we're going to avoid contingent valuation, which is very specific to the place and time. Our, our models are driven by maps of land use change, management, climate, and biophysical properties over time. So remember, one of the important things about economic valuation is that it's a trade-off. So as things change over time, what do we gain? What do we lose? Okay. We're, we have modeling complexity, different tiers. We have a very simple tier and then more difficult tiers. Right now, we're actually, we have published some of the software for the tier one and people are using it um, in various places throughout the world. And we're increasing the model linkages. So how does, service, how does surface water flow affect agriculture? Because one of the ways that we can value a service like surface water flow is through how it contributes to the production of products that are traded in the marketplace. So that, that means that the models need to be linked. Otherwise, we won't be able to necessarily put a value on surface water flow, for example. Okay. So we have this program, it's called Invest. You can actually go to, uh, there's a website where you can download it. It gives you a series of ArcGIS programs that allows you to run on any landscape. You have to put in some data, you have to put in some price data, et cetera, but um, it's there. But we've run into a bunch of difficulties as we're doing this. So I wanna just introduce some of the problems we've encountered and some of the um, some of the issues with some maps and some examples. Okay, let me start with provisioning services. So these are agriculture, clean water for drinking, timber and non-timber forest products, and hydropower. Okay, this is the value of agriculture. This is the gross production value of agriculture in Tanzania in 2000. It, ac it, it accounts for about 60% of all crops grown in Tanzania. It doesn't include subsistence farming, um, let me get these up right first. It doesn't include subsidence farming, or one of the big issues is it doesn't include the production costs. So this is gross value, okay? So we're setting up a baseline. Um, this is per hectare, by the way. Um, so you can see it goes up to um, 3,229 per hectare, up in the, uh, just west of Arusha. The, the other problem, too, is that here for Tier 1, we haven't used production functions. We haven't used yield functions. What we've used are maps of yields as a function of climate and soil type. So it's not sensitive to changes in processes and climate, um, but this is the beginning of a baseline. We're establishing a baseline value. 
So again, one of the things that we want to figure out is what is the value of a, of a regulatory or regulation, regular um, services within the agricultural sector. So without getting into hydrology modeling and without getting to various demands for surface water flow, we asked ourselves, what if we reduced the irrigation amount in each grid cell in Tanzania by 5%? What is the value of that last 5% of irrigation water in every grid cell? And this map gives you the um, productivity gains from surface water flow for irrigation, okay? So you can see that the last 5% of surface water gives us some modest gains. Now the reason we stayed at such a low level of change was because if you make major changes, then human agents are gonna change in the landscape. They're gonna change their behavior. They may farm different crops. They may move their, they move, move their crops. So unless we're willing to go into a much more complicated tier two type of um, valuation, you know, we, we can't make major changes in the landscape without grossly o or under or overestimating or wrongly estimating some of the value of services. So here's a case where we said, okay, let's maximize the amount of surface water flow on the landscape for irrigation, given the demands of industry and cities on the landscape. So this actually includes a hydraulic model that looks at the flow of water. And then we said, if a farmer can, will try to appropriate as much as possible for his crop. Now this is a lot more difficult because now farmers are gonna change their behavior as water, as the, uh, their water, what water they can assess goes up or down. So we didn't have the model that allowed us to uh, model human behavior, so we made guesses on how people would react to much changes. So this is a tier two analysis, but it's much more difficult because we have to somehow incorporate human behavior and how they react to changes in water availability. So, as I said, the other problem, too, is once you introduce a lot more irrigation into the system, production, you know, production supply will change quite a bit, and that can have a huge effect on the market prices. So how do we predict market prices, too? Okay, here's another example of cleaner drinking water. This is from uh, 1855, John Snow, when he looked at the cholera epidemic in London. This is a really simple case, right? You can see the, the red circle in the middle, it was the pump that had cholera, and all of these bars represent the people that died due to drinking that water from that well. Okay, in this case, it's really easy to value the, the value of cleaner drinking water. You cut out the source of cholera, all those people live, multiply that by the value of statistical life, and you have the value for that change, right? So that's a really easy way to do it, as long as you can figure out what the value of someone is, which is obviously not, not as easy, but it's a point where, from a modeling perspective, this is quite easy. What do we do in today's world, though, where people are not dying necessarily? I mean, there are parts of the world where people are dying from drinking unpotable water, but what about like in the US where we're drinking potable water? Well, how do we value a change in the landscape and how that has an effect on the change in water quality? So one thing we can do is that let's, let's look at a water body of interest. Is it above the TDML without remediation? If it is, then, I mean, if it's not, then let's say there's a land use change in the landscape. How does that affect the TDML um, levels? Again, if it's not above the TDML, that land use change has no value because there was no policy change. There was nothing that we had to do the water systems are not um, water systems are not char are not charging their customers to to um, clean up their water. So that's a case where again, this is where when we don't have you know clear well, we can't do a contingent valuation and we can't ask people how much more they'd be willing to pay for cleaner water. What can we use as a as a metric of benefit? And here the metric that we can use is is policy. And how, peop and how a land use change will affect the cost of complying with a policy that has been set up for whatever reason it was set up for. So the point here is that if, we, if a land use change suddenly brings us below a TDML or brings us closer to the, the, the limit, then 
we can use the cost of compliance as a way to measure this. So this is kind of an avoided damage or avoided costs. Another issue to bring up is that a lot of ecosystem services have a, both a stock and a flow value. Okay, so if you want to uh, properly uh, value something like a forest and its provisioning service of timber and non-timber forest products, you can't just worry about today's harvest. You have to worry about how that's going to affect all other harvests. It's a very complicated thing to model from an economic perspective, even from a biological or ecological perspective. So in our tier one system, we basically set up assumed steady state analysis, and this is a classic steady state analysis of a forest. The problem with this is that in reality, we know that forests are not in steady state. A lot of the places around the world are being depleted. So how do we make that jump into doing a tier two analysis where it's a lot more complicated? So this is a case where for expedience in tier one, we have um, assumed a steady state and that's problematic. Um, I'll just skip over this and talk, these are some of the other services we value. Here's another example of the difficulties we have in valuation. This is carbon storage in Tanzania as of 1995. The green polygon areas are the mountains of the, of the Eastern Arc Mountains, and the top of those mountains tend to have the last undisturbed native forests in the world, in, in Tanzania. Again, coming back to our perspective of what a service is, carbon storage in and of itself is not a service because we're not that it's sequestration compared to some baseline which reduces the potential economic damage to the climate change is a service though. But so one way we can turn this into a service to say what is the potential that some of these areas in brown may be cut down and developed. So this goes back to what was brought up yesterday about red. So avoided emissions. So what's the value of avoided emissions? Because if we can avoid emissions, that's actually a service because if those emissions were expected and built into the climate change baselines, if we can halt that or stop that deforestation, then that becomes a service. And then we have to ask ourselves, what's the value of this service? And in what we're doing in the Natural Capital Project is we're saying that the, the value of carbon sequestration is the value of economic damage avoided from climate change. Okay, so what do we do about the services that are, that we're loath to put a dollar value on, such as biodiversity, and cultural services. So these are just some maps, about diversity maps that we can produce in natural capital prod in the in the invest system that look at habitat quality, or in this case here, look at how species, how habitat for particular species, in this case federally threatened herptofauna, herptofauna, how they change with respect to changes in the landscape. But so how can we bring these in to a system where we can't place a dollar value in biodiversity? And this is where we get into trade-offs. So here's an example of, on the x-axis, we have the net present market value of three different trajectories of land use change in the Willamette Basin of Oregon as projected by, um, these are three different um, alternative futures. And then on that y-axis, we have a measure of biodiversity persistence. And you can see the green is a conservation scenario where there was, um, where there was, uh, um, much more attention was paid from 1990 to 2050 in making sure that land was preserved. And you can see in that green circle, that is where the biodiversity score is high, but notice that the trade-off for that is we have less economic production on the landscape. We can sacrifice, in the other scenarios, we sacrifice biodiversity protection for economic valuation. Okay, but that's economic valuation of the traditional services. If we include the carbon sequestration value also generated on those landscape, that's where we have the, the triangles. And suddenly, if that becomes a marketable commodity, if the, if the sequestration vis-a-vis -vis the baseline today becomes a commodity, the conservation scenario, which is much more favorable to keeping natural um, units on the landscape, that actually becomes the most economically valuable and the most beneficial from biodiversity's point of view. Um, I'll just skip these bundles. And I just wanted to say two other things. One thing is that the project is, is particularly um, interested in tracing this to people um, in poverty throughout the world. So here's a map of Guatemala, and the red areas represent um, the red polygons that are um, given a, um, just an outline, represent 
areas of water production that are used in various cities throughout Guatemala. And then the, the, the polygons that are different colors represents poverty rates. So this is where can we line up people that provide services and how do they line up with their um, economic opportunities and can we somehow develop PES systems that will help them out. And the other thing that uh, Dick brought up yesterday is how do we do all this modeling with respect to climate change? So, and again, in INVEST, we've, we've allowed for some analysis of what land use change with and without climate change means. And this map basically shows the loss in carbon storage if we include climate change with a traditional land use, land cover trajectory map over time.